I baptize thee having authority from the almighty God as a testimony that ye have entered into a covenant to serve him. I have need to be baptized of thee. Come and start to me. Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. I baptize thee having authority from the Almighty God, as a testimony that you have entered into a covenant to serve him, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew chapter number 3, we'll begin reading in verse number 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we ask once again that you would just open us up to the possibilities that you've placed before us. Lord, help us see Jesus. Help us see his life, his ministry. Lord, Holy Spirit, open our hearts and our thoughts to the, to the possibilities of what you can do. Lord, you came to be our conqueror. You came to be our king. But you came to be the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Lord, this is our ministry, this is our opportunity to serve you, to join you in what, you, what it is that you're doing. So Lord, speak to us personally. Father, may it not just be a, another message, another sermon, but Lord, Holy Spirit, speak and create change. Give us the gift of repentance. And oh God, we will give you glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. What a day that must have been when John was there following God's leadership in his life. He had gone to uh, not the big city of Jerusalem, not to the temple, not to the synagogue, but by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, God took him to the wilderness. And God was a part of this because people started to come to the place where John was, and the crowds were there. And, and it was an amazing thing. And he was preaching a message of repentance. 
We're not there. There are areas in our life where we need more of God. Unless you're a perfect person, and there are none of us. We need to, to have openness to all, anything God may be doing. We need daily repentance in our life. And there were people that were looking. There were people that were wanting. There were people that, that in their life they were being stirred for more of God. So when they heard the things that John was doing and the message that he was preaching, they were going out to that place. And what a wonderful day it was when Jesus walked up to be baptized. If you have your Bible, open it to uh, the Gospel of John. And we're in the series uh, for the next three weeks following today called per uh, Perceptions and Limitations. And we're going to be following John three or Matthew 3 and Matthew 4. But I like John 1 because John was there. John was an eyewitness to it. And he saw these things, and when he wrote his gospel, all those years later, about 60 years later, he shared these words. If you have your Bible in John chapter 1, verse number 19, God's Word says this, This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? I mean, they knew the stir, they knew the buzz, they knew what was happening, so they're like, why are all these people going out to the wilderness of all places to hear this guy? Who is he? We don't know anything about him. All we hear is that he, he wears some stinky leather stuff and he eats bugs. I don't know what we think about this guy. So the Pharisees sent someone out there to, to figure something out. Who is this guy? But look in verse 20. He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Let me just pause here, and I just want you to think about this and reflect on it. John had people who were coming to him. If you would talk about it as far as a church growth ministry was concerned, he was growing people. People were coming. They couldn't count them. All the people that were there, and they were being moved by God. They were, they were confessing their sins. They were being baptized. That was not a normal thing. They were saying, I have sins in my life that I want to die to. So they were doing the picture of the death, burial, and the resurrection. They were giving their heart and their life unto something that was new. They had lived their life one way. But now they wanted change in their life. They wanted power in their life. They wanted God's will to be done in their life. So the Pharisees hear it, and they're coming out there. Look, John could have had a great ministry if it was the ministry of John. But I want you to know right off the bat, do you see the humility? I'm not the one. I'm not the one. I confess to you. If you're looking at me, no, no, you're looking in the wrong place. It's not about me. Look what it says in verse 21. They ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? You remember Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind? Maybe they thought Elijah had come back. He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet, the one spoken of in scriptures? He answered, no. Verse 22, then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? You see, those people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they had a concept in their mind of what God would do. Now, it wasn't what God said, but it's what they thought. They were looking for, for God to come and, and to do something great and mighty. There was a, the circumstances were that Rome was there. Rome was the ones that were in charge, and they had soldiers. And you better do what the soldiers told you to do. And they charged taxes, and you better pay taxes. You see, it was about government, it was about power, it was about authority, it was about rule, and they didn't like it, but Rome had it. And they could read some obscure passage in the Old Testament that said, when the Christ comes, he will rule and reign. So they're looking and they're saying, are you the one? Are you the one? Well, if you're not the one, then why are you doing this? Look in verse 23. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. I'm not the one. I'm simply here to prepare the way for the one. Like as, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent 
were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered and said, I baptize you with water. I baptize you, you with water. Now, I can baptize you with water. I mean, we can, I can bring you back here and blow the screen, the baptismal pool back there, and we fill it up with water, and they'll make it good and warm for you. They'll make it as pleasant for you as possible. Anybody here baptized in the creek in January? No. My mom said the only time you could get saved was August because that was the only time warm enough to be baptized was in the creek in August. I can baptize you with water. Anybody can do that. I, I remember I was baptizing this lady one time. And she was deathly scared of water. So I back there and I raised my hand and said, uh, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I lowered her down and she came back up. I said, well, that didn't work. So I told the church, I said, we'll, we'll do better. So I did it again. I lowered her back down. I didn't say all the words over again. I just started back down with her. It was like a turtle with a head coming up. Her head just popped back up. Part of me said, I'm just going to let it go. You know, I'm just going to, she got enough, right? But I'm a baptized, Baptist, and I believe in immersion, right? We're going to get you under the water. I mean, you don't just partially die. We're going to kill you, right? So the third time, I lowered her down, and I kicked her feet out from under her, and she went down. And she must have got the Holy Ghost, because when she came up, she went, <gasps> Look, I can baptize you with water. But what we need is a baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need a baptism that shows that we are dying to self and we, lure, we are live, living serving Him. Baptism shows being unto Him. It's not about me. Look, he, he, they said, he said, I baptize you with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. You don't know who it is. You can see this world through the, through the circumstances and what, you, what you've read and that sermon that you've heard. But I, I'm telling you, he's here. He said, it is he who coming after me is preferred before me. That's good theology right there. Whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He is saying even the smallest thing. I'm not even worthy to, to loose his sandals. He is so great. He is so mighty. And y'all don't see it. He's right here amongst you. Verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him. And he used that prophet voice. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I mean, could you imagine everybody's talking, everybody's milling around? I don't know how many people were there. But when John saw him, you know he had a point, right? He looked at him and he pointed and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. They were looking for a, a king. They were looking for someone to kick Rome out. They were looking to someone to help them economically, someone to help them with power, someone to help them, serve them, make it easy for them. John said, no, no, no. Understand, this is the Lamb of God. They knew the picture of that. The lamb was the one who would be the Passover lamb, who would give his life, shed his blood, who takes away the sins of the world. Their, their thoughts took them one direction. But Jesus came to do something so much greater. Look what, look what he says here. Behold the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me. For he was before me. I did not know him. That's key. We'll talk about that in a second. But that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. Listen. God said, I'm going to send, told John, I'm going to send the Christ, the Messiah, the one. Now's the time. John gets fired up about this, and he goes out, and he's preparing the way. He's preaching. Turn from your sins. Give your life to God. God's about to do an amazing thing. He was making the, the way possible. He's preparing them for what was coming. 
But he didn't know it was Jesus. This is his cousin. You know that they had, that, though they didn't live in the same city, you know they got to know each other. You know they probably had family get-togethers get and all that kind of thing. But he didn't know it was Jesus. Now he knew that Jesus was a righteous person. If you're going to judge by doing the right thing, Jesus always did that which was right. Jesus always said the right thing. Jesus was always loving. Jesus was always kind. Jesus was always giving. Jesus was always serving. So when, when jo John saw Jesus come to him, he said, I'm not worthy to be baptized by you. If we're going to talk about sins, I'm the one with the sins, not you. Jesus said, no, 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 permit it. We're going to fulfill all righteousness. You don't understand this, John, but God's up to something. God's going to do a great work. Look what it says in verse number 32. John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. And he, that is the Holy Spirit, remained upon him. I did not know him. Now, he knew Jesus, but he didn't know him as the Christ. I did not know him, but he, that is God, who sent me to baptize with water, said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. That's an amazing statement. Later on in his ministry, Jesus would say to his disciples, who do, you, who do men say that I am? Well, some say that you're the Elijah. Some say you're prophet. You know. Yeah, but who do you say that you are? And Peter stepped up and said, you're the son of God. John beat him to the punch. God told him, the Christ is coming. The one, the, the blessed hope is here. And John began to proclaim, let's get ready. God is going to do something amazing. Let's get ready. Let's give our hearts and lives to Christ, to, to God. Then when he sees Jesus coming, immediately he humbles himself. I'm not worthy to baptize you. Jesus is permitted to be so. Come on now. And he baptizes him like he baptized all the others. And when he came up out of the water, the heavens opened. And the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and lit on him and remained on him. And then the voice of God. By the way, nobody had to say, uh, who was that? When the heavens open and you hear God's voice, I believe God can get your attention. Amen? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I sent Him on mission. And He loved and He served. He was quiet. He did what His parents told Him to do. Every day he could have walked out and done and did what he wanted to do. But he always did the things of the Father. Remember when he was 12 years old? And, and we hear this story and we remember it because when Jesus went with his family to Jerusalem, we, we always remember the part that the family left and Jesus didn't go with them. And it took days for them to finally find him. And then they found, they found him at the temple. And what was he doing? He was preaching the word of God. And he said, i got to be doing my father's business. But look, he didn't come in. Even then, he didn't come in and say, listen to me. I have a word for you. No, he just preached the word of God. Right? He didn't say, I'm going to be the Christ. No, he humbled himself to that. At that point in time, he didn't say, follow me. He went home with mom and dad. Went back out to the carpenter shop kept his mouth shut and loved people and served people and helped people and prayed for people and faced temptations and went through things that we go through. 
yet without sin. And saw the circumstances of life, but he saw them differently. He didn't look at the things of life the way normal human beings did. He looked at them under the will and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Things were different. Can you imagine when John baptized him and he brings him up, the heavens part, the dove descends, the voice of God is heard. I bet his eyes got that big. Amen? Now I know this is the one who was preferred before me. This is the one because he was before me. This is the Son of God, the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. And the Pharisees and the scribes and those who should have known best walked away. Walked away. Because it didn't match their perception. You know, I've been preaching this Bible a long time. I, I don't know how many sermons I've preached. I don't know. I, uh, I should have counted them. But I know for over a decade, I preached five times a week. So they said I was a preaching machine. All I know is it was a, it was a gift that God placed on my heart and God opened the door and I was going to seek to fulfill it. But that didn't mean I did anything good. You know what my observation is? We don't need another sermon. We're sermon deaf. But when we know the Word of God, and like James says, and we don't do it, I have seen good people study the Word of God with it and, and know it. I mean, they can tell you the stories. And they, they can memorize Scripture, but there's never any evidence in their life of what this is. Now, we're all born, and we learn what society teaches us. Our parents teach us, now, don't do this, you need to do this. Watch out for that. Right? That's what our parents teach us. And can I say praise God for that? And then they send us to school. And they teach us to value this and don't value that. And then other things that teachers and parents, other influences come into our life. And we begin to be led in one direction and led in another direction. And what we understand is that our concept is being formed. How we view things, how we see things. What we won't, what we don't want. And then all those things culminate together, and we, we get what is called our worldview, how we see the world, and how we see ourselves in the world. The problem arises when it doesn't fit Scripture, the truth. Here's. What we never, we, this is what we need to be on guard about. When you hear preaching, when you do Bible study, when you're having your quiet time, what we need is not just to see the Scripture, we need to let the Scripture see us. We need daily repentance. Daily repentance. Because when I look into this and when I hear the Spirit of God and the, the movement of God, I need to be quick to say, yes, Lord. Every day, I want to ask myself two questions. I come to the end of my day and I say, Lord, what was it that you did in my life today that brought you honor and glory? I want to see those areas in my life where he used me. And to that, I want to see amen, say amen. But you know, I don't stop there. I say, but Lord, what is it that I did today? Now listen to me now. You, you've heard me say this a lot. and You're going to hear more of it. What is it that I did today that grieved your spirit? What is it that I did today that I ignored the word of God and did what I wanted? 
or what I thought or what mama said or what daddy taught me or I always heard or I believe. Now, come on. Whenever we do that, we just walked out of the will of God. How many of y'all believe God should override any other concept or theory or paradigm or worldview? How many of you want a heaven worldview? How many of you want the Word of God living in your life, breathing in your life, moving in your life? You see, they, they saw the Christ. It had been 400 years, 400 quiet years, and they said, when the Christ comes, this is what he's going to do. The Christ came, but he didn't do what they wanted. He did it differently, and what did they do? They rejected it. May it never be. See, what we need to do is we need to take Scripture, we need to read it, we need to look at it, and the Holy Spirit needs to join us there. And the Holy Spirit will say, did you see that word? Now, what that's saying, Brian, and what you're doing is two different things. We like our own comfort, don't we? But the Holy Spirit's not so interested in our comfort. What He wants is our holiness. So He wants to challenge us to move from where we are to where we need to be. How much of this do we already know that we're not living? Because there's no power of God. How many, how much are we, as we face the circumstances of life, We do what we think, what we want, what we believe. And we put limits on what God can do. All right. Can I I give you an example? Let me tell you a story about the New Testament. Jesus puts his disciples in a boat at night and sends them out to go to the other side of the lake. At night, and a storm comes up. Y'all remember the story? The winds are blowing, the waves are kicking in. I mean, they're scared to death. And Jesus just comes strolling out over the lake, walking on the water. Just peacefully walking. That wind knows better than to blow against him, right? I mean, it was raining everywhere, but he was just in the and holy umbrella over him. Just walking in peace and in love. And they see him, and immediately they say, it's a ghost. I mean, their theology went right out the window when they saw the circumstances of life. And then they figured out, he said, peace. Right? It's me. Hey, guys, it's just me. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Now, they're in the boat. Right? Waves are coming. Winds are blowing. And old Pete says, it sure does look better where he's at. Lord, bid me come to you. And you know what Jesus said? What did he say? Come on. You want to be where I'm at? Come on. And you know what Peter did? He went beyond his limitations. He went beyond what he had seen or heard. But Jesus said it was okay for him to come, so you know what? He threw one leg over that boat and threw the other leg and just walked out on water. Y'all bunch of Baptists looking awful proud back there. He walked on water. When was the last time you walked on water? But hold on, he stopped and he started looking and he said, hey, I'm not supposed to be doing this. And he saw the circumstances and he began to put a limit on it. Google, 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 Google. Prayed a quick prayer. Lord, help! Jesus heard, raised him up. In my mind's eye, Scripture don't tell us this, but I believe the Lord put his arm around him. Pete, proud of you. And there's 11 others in the boat witnessing it. Still in the boat. I mean, they should have been jumping over the side of that boat faster than you can imagine. They should have gathered around Jesus and had a holy praise God meeting. Amen? Right there on the water, jumping up, praising God, giving God glory because with Jesus, there are no limits because of your circumstances. If you've got a word from God, that's a word that's good enough. 
But they didn't join Jesus. Jesus had to join them. And we look at our circumstances and we have to begin weighing it out. Can God do this? Or we don't even look, we don't even put God into the circumstances. We just start acting the way we've always acted, thinking the way that we've always thinking, been thinking, limiting God, walking through a worldview of what we can do. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. That didn't mean you can just do all things. You can't just walk out there and say, hey, I believe I'm going to do this and God's going to bless it. You better get a word from Him. What I'm telling you is this. If God says do it, then you have all the authority of God to be with you in carrying it out. No limits. No limits now. Why are we living under the perceptions and the limitations of the wisdom of this world? When we call ourselves children of the King. People say, why did Jesus have to be baptized? Well, it wasn't about him. What he was doing was showing what he was, his ministry was all about. From the very beginning, he was showing that he was going to have to go to the cross of Calvary, that he would have to give his life, that they would bury him. He would die, and they would bury him. But praise God, on Resurrection Sunday, he came out. Talk to Jonah. He gave us an example of what it would be. There are no limitations. You know, maybe God's just waiting for us to look at it and stop and pause and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to act? What should I say? What should I not say? What should I do? What should I not do? Where should I go? Or should I just stay? Walking and abiding with Christ. And all of God's people were changed. We're living below what it means to be a child of God. We fear the world more than we do quenching the spirit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What would it be like if God's people had a fresh, clear vision of joining Him and obeying Him? Letting the Scriptures come alive. For three and a half years, in Jesus' ministry, he went out and what we would say would perform miracles. I'd say if you take a little kid's lunch and you could feed thousands with it, I'd call that a miracle. Matter of fact, if you can go to somebody who's been dead four days and say, Lazarus, come forth, and he comes walking out, I'd say you're not bound by the circumstances of this world. Why did he do that? To let us know that there is a Lord who has power that is greater than all the circumstances of all the things this world can bring to us. We're going to, for the next three Sundays, we're going to study Matthew 4, where Jesus was taken into the wilderness and he was tempted by the devil three times. We're going to see how Satan looked at it and we're going to see how God viewed it. And we're going to see how Satan painted the picture. And we're going to see how Christ obeyed Scripture and truth. And we're going to learn how we can face what I believe is the normal temptations of the day and be an overcomer, be victorious the way Jesus gave us that example. But it does no good to know the answer if we're not going to follow the answer.